Thank you, Jersey. Today's scripture is from the lectionary. It's from the Gospel of Luke, starting with chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, 1 through 11. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord to go to the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. God bless the reading of his word. Today's message is titled, The Life of Bees. Now, the words written by Luke were probably, you know, Luke was a doctor, physician in those days. He never really experienced Jesus, never met Jesus face to face, but he was a very close friend of the Apostle Paul. So he's describing, I'm sure, what Paul probably relayed to him about Jesus sending out these additional messengers, and it's an additional a group of messengers, 36 pairs, other than the disciples. And in Jesus directing these messengers and teachers, he not only told them what they were to convey to the people, what the good news was, but he also told them how he wanted them to do it and how they should conduct themselves. Jesus knew that these messengers' gifts and abilities he knew what they were, and he empowered them to go out and spread the good news of the gospel and heal those who were in need of healing. And Jesus made sure that if these messengers encountered an overwhelming reception, to, uh, you know, they found receptive ears where they went, then they were to ask for more help when they needed it. And as a church or gathering of like believers, we should be able to appreciate the task presented to these new messengers of the day. I'm sure that each of them had their own specific talents and gifts that allowed them to contribute to the common good or the common purpose and the cause of the church or God's kingdom as a whole. And as I read this scripture, I thought about the comparison between a church and a hive of honeybees. I know the scripture talks about food. I did not bring potato chips today. I've, I've been asked by 20 people, no potato chips. If you weren't here for the last time I was uh, honored enough to be called here, uh, I preached about potato chips. But anyway, just a little bit of background. I am a hobbyist beekeeper. They call them beakers or beaks, B-E-E-K-S. I'm in my third year as a beekeeper and even though I plan to have about six hives by now, I've only got four, I think. I haven't opened them in the last month to do an inspection, so it's time. But I must say up front that if I haven't learned anything else about bees, I've learned that they have a PhD in frustrating beekeepers. 
they say that most people get into beekeeping because of the bees. You know the importance of bees and the pollination and how if we lose all the bees, we're going to go hungry, right? But they, people get into beekeeping because of the bees and they get out because of the honey. You see, a healthy hive produces about five gallons of honey a year. And my wife says, what are we going to do if we end up with 30 gallons of honey? You know, everybody wants local honey. And how long's that little bear jar last you? Two years, right? So what are you going to do with 30 gallons of honey? Just so you know, honeybees are not pets. They don't recognize you. They don't come running to the door glad to see you when you come home. They're not like a dog or a cat. Honeybees live about 45 days. And when you realize that, out of a hive of anywhere from 7,000 to 15,000 bees in one single hive, then you realize that the character of the hive changes totally every 45 days. Today, the bees that I see when I open a hive are not the same bees that were in that hive two months ago. That makes sense? You with me there? And the population of the, of the hive changes. It adjusts for the season. Right now we're coming into what's called the dearth. It's, it's the dead season. Uh, of course, we've had so much rain recently, the dearth may be put off for another 30 days because we still have a lot of blooming going on, uh, plants blooming. But, you know, honeybees are so interesting. They sit out on the back or sit out on the front porch of the hive in the evenings, just like we do. They just enjoy the weather. Sometimes they do what's called washboarding. And the bees, they get on the, the vertical surface on the front of the hive and they kind of cover it. And it looks like they're lining up shoulder to shoulder and line dancing. Really, that's what it looks like. They just rock back and forth between the front legs and the middle legs, just moving back and forth. We don't know why they do it. They just do it. You know, the bees talk about frustration. I can read in a book all day long that if I do this, the bees should do that. Let me tell you, the bees didn't read the book. The queen bee lives about three to five years. She's the only one in the hive that actually sees a year or a progress of multiple seasons. Uh, the queen controls her laying activity, which controls the population of the hive. Do you know that a queen bee can lay as many as 1,100 eggs a day? That's a lot. And if you took a grain of rice and you split it long ways, about eight ways, that's about what it looks like when you look down into a, a, a cell in a hive and look for the eggs. That's what it looks like, just a little sliver standing up in the middle of that hive, in the middle of that cell. Keeping bees is work, and it costs some money. And yeah, you know what? The, it's so rewarding. Sometimes, when I can't be found in my house, you'll find me sitting back on my bench right by the beehives, watching the bees, listening to the hives, the hum inside the hives. Uh, you got to get up close for that. You can do that without wearing a protective gear as long as you're not invading the hive. The bees will every so often fly around and check you out. A lot of times they'll land on your hand or land on your leg. They're no harm. They won't, you know, as long as you're not a threat to them, they're not a threat to you. Occasionally I'll have one buzz around my head. And we rescue bees out of the bird bath pretty regular. They like to line the bird bath and we put rocks and sticks in there so they can climb down and get a drink of water without getting their wings wet. You see, if a honeybee gets its wings wet, it'll drown. It, they can't swim. And I got to tell you a little story, my brother Dave Shale, exactly two years ago, 4th of July, I get a phone call from Dave Shale and he says, 
this is about 11 o'clock. He says, what are you doing at 1210? 1210? You know Dave. He says, I'm coming to see you. Okay. He pulls up in that beat up van and I meet him in the driveway and he, you know, remember how Dave is, gets right in your face. I said, what are you up to? I'm here to face my biggest fear. I want you to introduce me to your bees. So we go out back. And I do the same thing with Dave that I do with little kids. We start out at the bird bath. And, and we're standing there, you know, that's, that's non-invasive. He's not threatened. He's safe. He's standing there and he's looking. And we're watching the bees. And there's one doing a backstroke. I said, Dave, that bee will drown if we don't rescue that bee or if it doesn't get over to the edge. And so I stick my finger down in the water and the bee climbs up on my finger and it sets there a minute and it flaps its wings and it dries them off and it's getting ready to fly away and I turn around like this and Dave is a runaway. He's going the other direction. I, we eventually got him back over there. We sat back out at the hive. He he did breathe after a couple of minutes when a couple of bees came over and landed on his leg but it was such good memories but so we have to save the bees sometimes we save them from drowning we like watching the girls we call them the girls because the majority of those bees are all female all the worker bees are female of course the queen's a female you know the drones they're about absolutely useless now we're not going to talk about the difference between the guys and the gals in church, okay? About the women do all the work and the guys are useless. But, um, I didn't say that. Drones have one purpose in life. They don't have a stinger. Drone bees eat honey, they eat pollen, they eat nectar, they drink the water that's brought into the hive. And all they do is they wait till it's time to go fertilize a queen, an unfertilized queen. That's their purpose in life. And I gotta tell you, sitting out on my back porch in the mornings or looking out the back door, my apiary or bee yard is to the east, and you see the sun coming up behind it. And you ever seen those time-lapse videos of airports with the planes circling and coming in, and they just keep coming and they keep coming and taking off, and that's what it looks like looking out in the morning and watching those bees and you know that's real comforting to me unlike some of those I've got some lesser intelligent friends Jim Cox who think golf is relaxing Don Johnson they think golf is relaxing coach you're not one of those are you you're not Golf is frustrating. Watching bees is relaxing. So, it's therapy for me. If you can't find me, working on 20 other things, I'm usually sitting out there with the bees. You know, actually, the man who's credited with the development of the, the modern hive that's used today, it's the Langstroth hive. It was Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth, in 1851, his study of bees was his therapy. He had some mental issues. Real, no, no, I mean, he really had mental issues. He had mental health problems. And, and he studied bees as a therapy. And he, he discovered what we call bee space. It's about a nine millimeter space that bees just love. If there's space in the hive between the frames or any bigger than that, they will fill it in. They'll build it in to about nine millimeters. If it's any smaller, it's a space they can't get in. You see, a honeybee is about 14 millimeters long. That is uh, just right at a half inch, a little touch of over a half inch. Uh, and, and how do those bees have such an impact on us as small as they are? Getting back to Reverend Langstroth, he was so mentally disturbed that when he submitted patents to get his hive patented, nobody had listened to him. He's crazy. 
but a friend, somebody else, looked at his work and got the patents accomplished for him. And that's the hive that's commonly used today worldwide. So how do I see the life of bees in today's scripture? The bee's pretty small, but each honeybee has a specific purpose at specific times of its life like us in our maturity, our spiritual maturity, and our relationship with God. When a bee, let me share this little list with you. It's from a, a time frame chart from beekeepingbasic.com. When a bee is one to two days old, it has a job of cleaning the cells in the hive, starting with only the one they were born in, and they also help keep the brood warm. At three to five days, their job is to feed the older larva. Now my first thought is, why the older larva? The older larvas used to being fed. Kind of hard to mess that deal up, okay? So they learn to feed the older larva, and then six to 11 days old, they're responsible for feeding the younger, or the youngest larva. And 12 to 17 days old, they produce wax, which, by the way, do you know it takes eight ounces of pollen to make one ounce of wax? Imagine how many trips that takes for a bee to make one ounce of wax. Oh, in that 12 to 17 days, they produce wax, they carry food, they build comb, and they have undertaker duties. They remove dead bees from the hive and they kind of coax out the dying bees that are sitting too close to the door. I, I don't mean to be pointing at David Eck and Jim Cox and Worth Bracher, but you're sitting a little too close to the door. Okay. And then 18 to 21 days old, the bees are tasked with protecting the hive. They have guard duty. And from 22 days to the end of their life, about 40 to 45 days, they travel as far as three to six miles from the hive to collect pollen and nectar and water. You know, up until that 22 days, those bees never leave the hive. They never see the daylight. They All their chores, all their tasks are are conducted within the confines of that hive. So a lot of times, especially in winter, when the temperature gets above about 45 degrees, you can see what almost looks like a cloud or a, a, a swarm forming where the bees are doing what's called orientation flights. It's those bees' first time outside of the hive. And you know what they orient to? They can find the entrance to that hive, no matter how small it is, and they do it all in relationship to the sun, just like the old sailors used to do. Bees are pretty smart. All these bees that we're talking about is the female worker bees. You see how each bee develops in individual skills as it matures, and each one of those skills contributes to the whole of the hive. And we're reminded regularly of nature's delicate balance between pollinating insects and our food supply. And it's narrowed all the way down to each individual bee doing its part for the benefit of the hive. There's a book written by Thomas B. Seeley. It's called Honey Bee Democracy. I would recommend that reading to everybody. It's pretty cool. Talks about beehives. But you know what I got most out of that book? Every single thing that a bee does is for the benefit of the hive as a whole. Sometimes it's an overcrowding issue, which means the bees need to take half the, half the bees, half the population, and the queen, and go find another place to live. Sometimes it's a decision by one bee to sting a predator. And do you know when a, when a honeybee stings you, or stings somebody, something, that bee dies. 
It sacrifices itself for the benefit of the hive. Boy, that's another sermon. We couldn't learn anything from the an analogy of any of this, could we? Well, except for maybe evicting the older bees, right? But think about it. Every single one of us, every single member of this church family, learning what their individual spiritual gifts are, their talents and graces, at any given moment in time, they change as we mature. So, what about us finding out what our individual spiritual gifts and talents and graces are and figuring out how we can fit those in to what's best and in the best interest of this faith community? When Jesus sent out those messengers, he knew what their individual skills were. He knew their strengths and their limitations. And when he sent them out, he did give them the option, if you need more help, ask for it. Especially when the harvest was bigger than what they could handle. What if we discovered and developed each of our skills and used them to contribute to what is best for the church, this church as a whole? What if every single thing we did and every decision we made was for the best interest of God church. You see, in the life of a beehive, there is no unemployment. Is there unemployment in the life of a church? You think about it. When was the last time you called the church office and said, hey, you got anything for me to do? And they said, nope. They got plenty to do. There's plenty of things we can be doing for the church. There's plenty of things we can be doing for this church. There's decisions we need to make for the benefit of those sitting in the pews with us. Can you pray? Can you teach young people new skills? Can you help mow the lawn or water the garden or clean the windows or sweep the floors or visit nursing homes and hospitals or prepare, share, and or deliver a meal? We can't just sit back and watch while others conduct the harvest, can we? I feel that it's imperative that we dedicate our skills to God's work and God's kingdom, but we must also proper, be proper, pardon me, we must also be properly equipped with his power. And we must have a clear vision of our purpose and of what God wants us to do. I challenge you today to discover and acknowledge your gifts that God has graced you with. And I challenge you to offer yourselves to do your part for the benefit of this specific faith community. Do it for the benefit of the high. 